Welcome to Freedom Church. It is uh, good to see you. My name is Michael White. I serve as the uh, lead pastor here. I uh, do most of the preaching and teaching, and uh, I'm grateful that you are uh, here uh, with us uh, today. Um, if you're a guest, uh, we just want to say special, special welcome to you. Uh, we, uh, we say it often, and we say it because we mean it, that this is a, uh, a safe place for you, kind of no matter where you're at in relation to the Lord. Uh, new believer, not a believer at all, kind of wherever you might be, uh, mature Christian looking for a church, kind of wherever you might be on that spectrum, uh, this is a good place for you to be uh, this morning. If you want to turn in your Bibles to Luke uh, 18, that's where we're going to be. But before we do that, you guys might have heard that there's a, there's a game tonight. Are you all aware of this? Like have you been living under a rock and somehow escaped all the hype? Um, yeah, somewhat of a big deal, Super Bowl uh, tonight. Um, you get the you get the spectacle of uh, the Super Bowl, uh, two weeks to prepare for a game, and all the hoopla and media days and uh, crazy questions. And, and sometimes what comes out in athletics and even as part of this week is you, sometimes you get the cockiness of some athletes, right? The way and and this is just part of it is just sports, right? Some some guys want to play, need to play, angry. They need to to have an edge. Um, they use arrogance and even contempt for others. Uh, to play, you know, uh, you know, kind of, kind of on that that boundary point <laughs> where they're about to lose control. And just a couple examples of of just arrogance in in sports. Usain Bolt, uh, y'all know him, right? Jamaican sprinter, uh, fastest man uh, in the world, um, won a gold medal in the hundred meter uh, dash at the uh, uh, 2008 uh, Beijing Olympics. And as he's running that world record pace. He gets to the last, I don't know, 10 meters or so, and he just kind of slows up to kind of showboat a little bit, still wins the gold medal, still sets a world record, right? So that's Usain Bolt. Um, you got T.O., Terrell Owens, NFL wide receiver. Uh, that guy could be a little brash, right? Um, once he did an interview with uh, the media in his driveway while doing sit-ups uh, while it, with a shirt off, just kind of sitting there, you know, pounding them out, doing a regular interview. Um, that guy would call out his QBs uh, when they uh, wouldn't throw to him like he wanted or when they threw it over his head, whatever. Um, that guy, when he was eventually became a cowboy, right? But as a 49er, he, uh, he defiled Cowboy Nation by, by doing that on the star uh, at the Dallas Cowboys field. And once he said, I'll watch the highlights every now and then, but as far as watching the game... I feel like I am the game. So, so there you go. Tons of humility there. Uh, Muhammad Ali, um, maybe the greatest uh, trash talker uh, slash uh, rhetorician among uh, modern athletes. Here's what he said. He said, I'm not the greatest. I'm the double greatest. Not only do I knock them out, I pick the round. So he picks out what, picks out what round and says, this is when you're going down. And he said, uh, in another place, he said, if you even dream of beating me, well, you better wake up and apologize. I like that one. Um, then you got, uh, just to stick back to football, because of the Super Bowl, right? You got Chad Ochocinco, Chad Johnson, but, you know, Ochocinco is a, yeah, whatever. Uh, there's three, <laughs> three things in life that are certain. Uh, Ochocinco says death, taxes, and 85, that's his number, will always be open. Uh, and then lastly, Michael Jordan, right? There is no I in team, but there is an I in win. There you go, right? So cockiness, cockiness is just a part of sports. In, in the grand scheme of things, you know, some of that's just ridiculous, right? It's just talk, it's funny. You know, maybe we'll see some stuff like that tonight as we're watching the Super Bowl. But, but far worse than athletic pride, like the things we're talking about, is religious pride. Religious pride, the sort of condescending, I'm better than you superiority, that boasts in human ability while then looking with scorn on others. And so today uh, we're wrapping up uh, the Heart of Freedom series. We've been in uh, since the beginning of the year. And we've been looking at some of the central passions of our church, things that our heart as a church beats for, things like the gospel and diversity and mercy ministry and missional community. And today as we're wrapping it all up, we're going to look at transparency. And, and when I say transparency, what, what we mean is that as a church, we want to be a place that keeps it real, all right? We want to keep it real. Rather than wearing religious masks, rather than kind of strutting around with our own boastful religious pride, instead, 
We want to be a place that's intensely aware. When I say we, I mean us, church. We want to be intensely aware of our own sin. We want to be a place that is filled with humble gratitude and joy at the redeeming work of God, the gracious work of God to save us. And so as we're looking at at Luke 18 today, wrapping up this series, we're going to see a contrast. There's a huge, stark contrast between two men. And we're going to see religious pride on the one hand and humility on the other. And what I want us to take away from this as a church is that we strive to be a church where humility and authenticity reign. So we look at this text of Scripture and we see how these two men are approaching God. Wants to come away with a model for, for how not to be and then for how we strive to be. So let's look at God's word together. Luke 18, verses 9 on down to 14. Jesus says this. He says, He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. This is God's word. Let's pray. We thank you for Jesus and for the way he taught. We thank you for parables. We thank you for the clarity that emerges in such a text like this. And so, Lord, would you help us this morning to look at this text, maybe familiar for some, but Lord, would you help us to look at this text and would you make your word a mirror for our hearts and souls? Lord, would you help us to see more lingering spiritual pride in our own lives? And Lord, would you convict us of that? Would you grip our hearts? And Lord, would you, by your Spirit, help us to put those things to death? God, be our teacher this morning, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So, let's, uh, let, let's jump right in. Jesus has been a teaching about prayer. If you go back, uh, just the first part of the chapter, uh, those first eight verses, he's been teaching about the need to be persistent in prayer. That's the, the parable of the persistent widow And now, in this text that we've just read, he's going to keep talking about prayer, but now he's specifically going to address the attitude of prayer. And so to do that, he's he's telling this parable that we just read. And and notice, I hope you saw this already, that parable has a specific target. It's got a specific audience in mind. He, He told them this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous while treating others with contempt. And so this parable features a pharisee right but but pharisees aren't nece- not necessarily the target of the parable i mean they could be included they're part of the audience maybe but it's those who i like the way the niv phrases it here were confident of their own righteousness and they look down on everyone else they're confident in their own righteousness and they're looking down on other people and so that's who this parable is for and we all we all know that person right I mean, you can be honest, right? You know that person, like the goody two-shoes, the, I mean, we can think of somebody that fits this description, right? Like someone who thinks that they've got it all together spiritually, looks down on people. And I, you know, I don't know what the stereotype is. Like they carry a big Bible. They listen to like Christian music all the time. I don't know. They're always like, you know, in the office, like shushing you if, you know, they hear a curse word or something like that. I don't, I don't know what the stereotype of that uber spiritual person is, but, but we, we have in mind, probably each of us does, that person in our life, right? But rather than you thinking about that stereotypical person who's confident in their own righteousness, looking down on everyone else, 
Friends, th- this morning, what I want you to do is to look at yourself. Because I'm talking about you this morning, and I'm, I'm talking about us, I'm talking about me. Do you trust in your own works before God? Do you trust in your own goodness? Do you trust in your own performance, your own lack of, well, I've not done anything really bad before God? Because church here, Jesus is not getting at that stereotype, that person maybe that comes to mind. He's coming after the people who think that they are good, who think that they're right, who don't realize they have a problem. This this Pharisee here that goes up that we see in this parable, he thinks he's good. He thinks he's straight with God. He's ticking off all the boxes and he's blind to his pride. And so what I want us to ask this morning, and already asked it in my prayer, was that the Lord would give us a mirror by his word to, to look and to expose us and to reveal who we really are. Because we can be smug and be quiet about it, right? We can have this in, invisible religious confidence about ourselves, sneering, being smug at others, And nobody even really knows it because it's happening in here and it's happening in our hearts. And so I just want to ask you, because what what this man is doing, or what the audience of this parable, rather, is is to, it's the people that treated others with contempt. To people who think they're righteous and treat others with contempt. I just want to ask you, maybe who are the others in your life to help maybe surface this? Is it somebody who's LB? identifying as LGBTQ? Is it your coworker who's atheistic or living irreligiously, just kind of out there in the world? Students, I don't know, is it, is it the boy or the girl at school just doesn't fit in, just feels strange or weird? Is it, is it the couple that's, that's not married, but they're living together? Is it the person that just perpetually can't manage money well Right? And so there's just this condescension about them. Why can't you hold a job? Is it from this week? Is it the politicians in Virginia and New York who over the last few weeks have just shown a flagrant disregard and devaluing of human life? Is it the fake news media? Is it enthusiastic supporters of a president that you can't stand personally? Who are the others in your life? that you sneer at and look down on with pride. And then even infuse that with religious pride. To think, man, I'm a, I'm a Christian. I would never do that. We wouldn't say it in our hearts, right? We wouldn't say it out, out sorry, we wouldn't say it out loud, but we might say it or think it in our hearts. We don't, we don't act, to use again, uh, Muhammad Ali, right? We don't act as, just as, as if we're the greatest. We sometimes think we're the double greatest, Right? Now, why doesn't the world just agree with me and understand and see things through my eyes? Friend, Jesus' parable is for you this morning. It's for you, and it's for me, and it's for all of us. Because we do this. We are confident of our own performance before God, and we look down on everyone else. And so to make it worse, we, we cover it up with the, the costume veneer of a life that, that pretends to have it all together. You guys look like you got it all together this morning, all right? So if that was your intention, good job, right? Like you came in, you, you look like you got your acts together. But the nature of sin is, this is an old definition, going back to Augustine and then Martin Luther expanding on it. The nature of sin is that we are curved inward upon ourselves, We are bent towards serving and exalting ourselves rather than bent outwardly toward exalting God and serving others. And so we are focused on preserving ourselves, propping up our own images of who we are, promoting the things that we do well, even while brushing aside with contempt those things that others do poorly. 
But in spite of that, in spite of that instinct, that sinful instinct and habit that I think all of us have because of the fall, that's not what we want to be as a church. We want to fight against that. That can't be who we are as a church if we want to be obedient to the scriptures. And so that's why we're striving to be a church where humility and authenticity reign. And so in order for that to be true, there's, there's two things, two things that we must do. And the first is this. Humility and authenticity will reign here. The first thing that we have to do is we have to kill prideful contempt. We have to kill prideful contempt. This parable here paints this amazing contrast of two men who are polar opposites. I mean, really, you can't get any more different than these two guys in this parable. Like, maybe the extremes in the weather we've had this past week, right? It's like freezing, freezing cold, right? And now it's like 60, and then I think it's supposed to be 70 uh, towards the end of the week. So crazy, right? North Carolina weather. So, but again, look at the contrast that we see with these men. Verse 10, two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. Now, culturally, again, you couldn't pick two men that are farther apart. This is kind of like the monk versus the murderer, right? Or this is the priest versus the prostitute. Or the Bible teacher versus the telemarketer, right? Telemarketers are probably not well thought of in our culture, And so if you just are kind of picking between two people, it's like, man, I'm going to pick somebody to go to God on my behalf and pray for me. Probably just off the bat, you're not going to pick the prostitute, right? You're going to go with the professional religious person. And and then beyond that, it went just beyond a, a perceived level of their religiousness. The tax collector we meet here, the tax collector in that day was culturally despised. And so, like, I don't know anybody that loves the IRS today, but in that day, it was even worse. Whereas the the Pharisee was somebody who was well-respected, was seen as, you know, a a godly pillar of society. Tax collectors, by contrast, were seen as sellouts by their fellow Jews. They were the traitors who went to work for the Roman Empire to take advantage of their brothers and sisters because the way tax collectors made their money was not just by going around and collecting for Rome what Rome was due, but these tax collectors had the, um, the ability to kind of tack on a surcharge on top of the tax. And they had great flexibility in what that surcharge could be. And so you've got these people who are ripping off their own race their own religious group of people working for rome and so they were not well thought of basically they were extortionists ripping people off stealing from their own people and so if you just look like non-biblical first jewish century texts regularly those those first century texts are grouping tax collectors along with people like murderers and robbers Again, this is not somebody that is well thought of at all. And even throughout the Gospels, we found over and over again that phrase that Jesus would associate with tax collectors and sinners. In other words, the worst possible people of all. That's what the scripture was trying to say by using that phrase. And so you've got this tax collector, but then you've got the Pharisee. And this Pharisee in verse 11, what's he doing? He's standing by himself. And he's praying thus. He says, I thank you, God, that I'm not like other men. And then he gives the, he gives the list. He, he's standing by himself, probably uh, in the inner uh, part of the inner court of the temple. And, and right out of the gate, we see what his focus is. You see what his prayer is about. This is all about condescending comparison. Prideful contempt is coming through this prayer. He thanks God, notice, not for God's mercies, not for God's sustaining grace, not for God's general care for him or anything else he could praise God about. But right out of the gate, the thing that he praises God about is that he's not like other people. Signals maybe what's most important to him, himself. And so then comes the list, right? We've got extortioners, those who rob and steal. You've got the unjust, that's a kind of a broad catch-all for, for evil, bad people. 
Or as my little two-year-old son right now likes to say, mean guys, right? So that's the unjust here. You've, you've got adulterers, and that's self-explanatory. And then best of all, it's just a nice touch, right? You know, he's aware of his context as he's praying this prayer to God. He looks around and he says, And God, man, I thank you that I'm not like that man over there. That tax collector. Miserable, traitorous tax collector. And so, again, before we're tempted to write him off and to say this is like a you know, Chad Ochocinco, T.O. kind of thing, just arrogant. Friends, remember, this is us. This is us. Think about the last time you slammed a coworker. You blasted a family member to a friend. You ranted about how obnoxious or lazy <laughs> that person in your life was. Isn't that, is that not the same kind of prideful contempt here that this Pharisee is showing? And so this is, this is what we do. This is what I do. We, we instinctively think that we are better than other people. M- maybe not everyone, right? There might be some people like, oh yeah, I'm not, I'm not at, that, at that guy's level. But there's always somebody underneath us, right, that we can look down upon. And so we flatter ourselves, thinking that we have something to commend to God. J.C. Ryle calls this the family disease of all of Adam's children. We think we have something to bring to the table. This man's prayer doesn't get any better as it goes along. Verse 12, I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get now now both of those just understand culturally that's above average that's above expectation it's kind of the the law uh, required people to to just fast once a year you had a you had a fast on the day of atonement but but some people would voluntarily fast on mondays and tuesdays uh, mondays and thursdays rather twice a week they're really godly guys and that's what this guy was doing and then he, he gave tithes, a, a tenth of all he got. So farmers would already have tithed their produce, but some of the Pharisees were tithing even the food that they would eat. So it's like you go to a restaurant, you get a meal, man, I'm going to set aside this portion for the Lord. And look at me, look how pious I am. Some of them even got so far as they would tithe herbs. Think like salt and pepper, Right? <laughs> on my baked potato you know i'm gonna i'm gonna set aside a tenth of my salt and man that's for the lord right so scrupulous right so diligent to be holy so this man's message here was pretty clear he is better than other people right and since he's gone above and beyond well god should be impressed with him right God should be impressed with him. But friends, can I just say, trying to impress God with our works is like me trying to impress Steph Curry with my jump shot, okay? Like that's not going to happen, okay? Some of you don't know how bad my jump jump shot looks, but just trust me, all right? Like that is not going to impress Steph, and we can't impress God by our works, but this is where we are by our very nature. We, we, we do this. We underestimate God's holiness on the one hand, and we overestimate our righteousness. So just to tease that out a little bit, we, we don't understand how holy, how perfect, how glorious, how pure God is. And then we also don't understand how our allegedly good works whatever things it is that we might point to. We don't understand that these allegedly good works are just barely scraps and threads that can't even begin to provide the the thick robe of righteousness we need to stand in God's presence. And so then, how is it, (laughs) what are we to do? This is the way that we naturally, sinfully are What are we going to do so that we don't have a church full of Pharisees? So that we can actually kill this prideful contempt that I'm saying just runs in the blood of all of us. Well, I think one way is that we have to be convinced of three truths that I want to walk you through. 
to kill prideful contempt. We've got to believe and understand these three truths that should shape and inform our lives. The first one is this. We've got to understand, first of all, that we are all big, bad sinners. That's a fancy theological term, right, that I used all of my training to come up with. Big, bad sinners. So just to quote J.C. Ryle again, he says, Never are men's hearts in such a hopeless condition as when they are not sensible of their own sins. This is a bad place. If ever we are not aware of our own sinfulness. And so the truth is, we can play the comparison game all day long, right? We can find somebody that we, in our mind, compare favorably to. But listen to what the scripture says. Romans 3. None is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All, it's pretty all-inclusive, right? All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless, No one does good. No, not even one. And so friends, if the scripture is true, and it is true, then what is the point and what difference does it make if you are more moral than other people that you know? What difference does it make? We are all vile and imperfect is what the scripture says. It's like going to to Lowe's and like comparing paint chips with like colors of black and trying to like discern which is blackest when actually the goal that your wife sent you on was to find sparkling white, right? It doesn't matter what the blackest is. The goal is to be pure and white. And none of us are that. Friend, what will be your defense before God when on that day... (laughs) He looks at you, and he's demanding spotless righteousness, and you stand before him stained with sin. Job says that if we wanted to challenge God, we couldn't even answer him one time in a thousand. Try a thousand times. This is not a test we are going to pass. This is not like my organic chemistry class that I took way back a long time ago at the University of South Carolina. I remember that class. I remember that professor, George Handy. People in that class, y'all, were making fours and eights on exams. I'm not joking. Fours and eights. I was not a good organic chemistry student, but I was a little better than some of the worst. I was making 40s, okay? 40s. I felt pretty good about that. But, but by the time I end the class, because of the curve, I got a B. I got a B. It's amazing. I got a B. Friends, that's not what God does, though. That's not what God does. This is a pass-fail situation, all right? Righteous or unrighteous. And Isaiah 64 says that our righteous deeds, even the best things that we could point to in our lives to try to give us credit, even our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. And so, friends, the first way that we we kill this prideful contempt that we often struggle with towards others is that that we have to start by considering ourselves as the biggest sinner that we know. Just begin thinking of ourselves in that way. Man, I'm the worst sinner I know because only I know what I'm capable of and the thoughts that run across my mind. I don't know what y'all are thinking. I just assume you're probably better than me. But I know the thoughts that cross my mind. And the things that I do when nobody's looking. And isn't this the progression that we see in the Apostle Paul's life? From starting off with an awareness of sin and then just kind of flowering into more and more. Just listen to this. We're going to track it chronologically. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 9, he says, I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called apostle because I was persecuting the church of God. He says, I'm the least of the apostles. That's where he starts in AD 56 worst one out of these guys it's a progression though uh ephesians 3 8 written a couple years later ad 60 61 he says to me though i am the very least of all the saints this grace was given to me to preach to the gentiles the unsearchable riches of christ now he's saying man i'm the least of all the christians out of all the christians all the saints i know man i am the least i am the worst doesn't stop there 
1 Timothy 1, 15. Best we know, written 62, 64 AD. He says, This saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. There, as his life is winding down, he says, man, I am the worst sinner I know. I'm the foremost of sinners. Jesus came, most of all, to save a really big, bad sinner like me. Now, now this doesn't mean that, that Paul is actually sinning more. He's not becoming more sinful. I don't think we have to think that as he's maturing. But what was happening for Paul is that he was, as he was walking out this relationship with God. He was beginning to see more and more of the sin that had been lurking in his heart. He was just seeing himself more clearly in light of God's holiness. The closer we get to the light, the bigger the shadow, right, that gets thrown. And so as we press into God's holiness, what that should mean is that the awareness of our sinfulness should grow. And so what this means for us, just relationally, is that Instead of looking at others with prideful contempt, we ought to look at others and and marvel at the mercy of God in our lives because it's only by God's grace that we are who we are. Some of of y'all have heard me use that phrase before. But but for the grace of God, there go I. I'm going to look at someone. But for God's grace, I'd be in that person's shoes or different shoes. So God has been merciful to me. And so when we see another person's sin, which, man, I'm really good at seeing other people's sin, I just got to be honest, man, I can spot it in a second, but I'm bad at seeing my own. When I see another person's sin with that clarity, what I need to do and what I try to train my mind to do is not to, to use that as an opportunity to gloat or to sneer or to puff myself up, but when I see that, that's a chance for me to examine my own sins. And to realize, you know what, I see their sin clearly. But I have sin that's lurking in my life. It's probably just as clear to them. And the way I feel about somebody else's sin, man, that's the way God feels about my sin. He hates my sin. And if he hates it, (laughs) and if I hate it in somebody else, how much worse is it that he hates it in me? So we've got to see ourselves, first and foremost, churches, big bad sinners and that's not your final identity right we want to come to the cross right but we come to the cross first with the bad news of the gospel and it's that the second thing again we've got to be convinced of this if we want to kill prideful contempt we have to understand that our works will not commend us to god our works will not commend us to god and this is this is hard because again just like the pharisee that we we meet here we we want to take matters into our own hands, all right? We want to be the, the solution to our own problem because that makes us feel good. You know, I, I, I'm not a freeloader, right? I'm earning, I'm working this thing out. Works is, is part of how we're wired up as, as humans. Look, just look at every world religion. But here's what we have to understand from the scriptures, that the matchsticks of works that we might try to, you know, fiddle together, those matchsticks will not be a life raft for us that will withstand the ocean of God's wrath that is coming. I love the song, the hymn, Rock of Ages, and and two of the verses just get at this so clearly. Uh, Augustus Toplady, I think, is the, the hymn writer. Great name. Suggest it for all you pregnant folks out here. But, but listen to the lyrics. Not the labor of my hands can fulfill thy law's demands. You hear that? It's not the works of my hands that will fulfill what you demand. Could my zeal no respite know? In other words, if I were ceaselessly working with endless passion, if my emotions, if my tears were forever flowing with contrition and sorrow over my sin, all for sin could not atone. You must save, thou must save, and thou alone. It doesn't matter what we do. Nothing in my hand I bring, the next verse. Nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to the cross I cling. Naked come to thee for dress. Helpless look to thee for 
grace. Foul I to the cleansing fountain I fly. Wash me, Savior, or I die. It gets it so well. We bring nothing to the table but our sin. And so the Bible teaches this, right? I'm not trying to, to preach a, a hymn. I'm trying to preach the scriptures, right? And that's what Top Lady was looking at. The Bible teaches that a person is justified, made right by God, with God, by faith, apart from works of the law. That's what Romans 3.28 says. We are saved by grace through faith, Ephesians 2 says. And just in case it's unclear, right, the Apostle Paul in that context there in Ephesians 2, he says, and this is not your own doing, but it is the gift of God. It's not a result of works. It's like multiple times he's coming back and saying, hey, if you don't understand this, let me clarify for you. It's not the result of your works. It is a gift. The Pharisee in this parable here thinks that his performance will give him credit in God's eyes. And, and that is what religion does. That's the way religion thinks. Religion says, I obey, therefore I'm accepted. If I get my act together and do this, then I will be accepted. But friends, the gospel is the exact opposite of that. The gospel says, I'm accepted. I'm accepted. Therefore, I obey. All of our obedience, all of our works, all the things that we do for the Lord flow out of the fact that we have first been accepted and loved and chosen in Him. In the gospel, acceptance comes first. That's what Romans 5 says. At the right time, while we were still weak, Christ died for the ungodly. We are accepted through the undeserved, unearned, unending grace of God who through faith in Jesus justifies those who believe. To the one who does not work but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Romans 4, 5. Friends, this is good news. I, I hope you see what good news, is, news this is for you as weary saints because you can't earn God's favor. Doesn't matter if you fast twice a week or 10 times a week. Doesn't matter if you give a tenth of all you get or half or 75% or whatever. Doesn't matter. It will never be good enough. And I hope that that comes as good news to you. Rather than discouraging you, that truth should liberate you. Liberate you. Because Jesus says, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Hebrews says, whoever has entered into God's rest has rested from his works. Because Jesus finished the work on the cross. And so what this means for us, church, corporately, as a body, means that if God isn't impressed by our works, then neither should we be. If we will boast, church, only in the cross of Jesus, then we will kill prideful contempt for people who might be at different places on the road than we are. And just trust that Christ will be all in all. Third truth that we have to embrace if we're going to kill this prideful contempt is we have to know that none of us has our act together. None of us has our act together. Again, just go back. Listen to the smug confidence that you hear in this guy. God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, even like this tax collector. I, I fast twice a week. I get tithes of all that I get. This guy clearly thinks he's got go it going on. Somehow, in the span of two verses, two short verses, he uses the first person five times. Five times, I, 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 I. He is consumed with himself. But friends, when we think about us, can we just stop the charade, please? And, we, and when we see him, <laughs> we know the truth, right? Only one man here in this parable goes down justified. And it's not this guy. It's not the guy with the crazy spiritual resume, it's not the guy who thinks he's got it all figured out. It's not the guy who is standing there by himself, boasting and proud of his spiritual performance. Earlier in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus has called out exactly this approach. He says, now you Pharisees, 
Y- y'all like to cleanse the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside you're full of greed and wickedness. He goes on in a second. He says, woe to you Pharisees, for, for y'all love the best seat in the synagogues and greetings out there in the marketplace. It, really, this Pharisee does not have his act together. He's just pretending. Because every one of us is in a fight for sin. Every one of us is struggling and wrestling. Every one of us will fight sin until the day we die. Every one of us, because of the brokenness of the world that we live in, we all contend with heartache and sorrow and suffering and grief nearly every day of our lives because that's the world that we live in. We can clean it up and, you know, smile and we can try to pretend. But the reality is life is hard. The, the struggle is real for us, church, to clean ourselves up, to, to hide our struggle, to hide our pain, to hide ongoing sin. And we, we come in here like we jockey for, you know, our favorite seat. We smile, we greet one another with a here or we see each other in the grocery store. We act as if everything is great. A couple of y'all even called that on me this morning. Like, how are you? I'm good, I'm great. Like, really? I'm like, ah, uh, no, I'm struggling, you know, just to be honest. Thanks, thanks for calling me on that, right? And so seriously, like, enough of the fakeness. For church, let's not, let's not allow this to be a place that falls into that trap where everything is fine, right? Everything's fine. We're all smiles, we're all pretending, we're all shallow. No, let's let this be a place where it's okay to not be okay. All right? Let's be a people who, when we gather together, battered and bruised by sin in our our marriages, sin in our family, sin in our relationships, sin in our culture, sin in our workplace, that we come together to nurse each other back to health. And so just to be clear, in case it's not already like, I don't, I don't have my act together. Not like I want to, not like I should. I struggle, I fight sin, sometimes I lose. I agonize over decisions, I'm often uncertain. I'm insecure, I'm needy. Jan and I don't have a perfect marriage. I mean, just come close to us, you'll probably see that. Sometimes we disagree, sometimes, though thankfully not as much as we used to, we don't fight. I mean, sometimes we do, though. Same goes for our elders, same goes for, for all of us in this congregation, right? We're not a picture-perfect congregation, with picture-perfect, kind of like Hallmark movie kind of life. Sorry, those of you that love that channel. And so what that means for us as a cultural identity church is that if we have that understanding about one another, that means that when we actually are honest about ourselves, when we come to each other (laughs) with brokenness or hurt, you're you're not going to get like surprise or like disappointment or kind of this condescending comparison, like, I can't believe that. No, instead, what we should get is sympathy, understanding, compassion from fellow strugglers who are on the journey. And so freedom, my prayer is that this would be our culture, a truly a safe place, we say it every week, right? A safe place for sinners, not to stay in their sin, but for sinners who want to fight sin, confess sin, heal, and grow in their godliness to the glory of God. Sinners of all stripes, all specifics, no matter where you come, to come and to fight and to grow. So that's killing prideful contempt. But we've got to do more than that. We can't just destroy these sinful attitudes. In its place... We must put something positive back. We must cultivate humble repentance if we desire to be a people where humility and authenticity reign. And so we see that example in this tax collector. Look at verses 13 and 14. Again, we've got the Pharisee doing his thing, and now we meet this guy, the tax collector. Standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven. But he beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Like immediately the differences jump off the page at us, right? Immediately we see this. Instead of the inner court, where again, probably that Pharisee is standing, this guy is far off. He's probably on the outer edge of the court of the Gentiles. He's keeping his distance. Again, we don't know this, we're not told this, but, but probably it's because he feels unworthy to even approach God. And so he's hanging way back, not barging in. And, and then look at the tone of his prayer here. There's not this confident self-focus that the other guy has. He doesn't even lift up his eyes to heaven. 
His posture is telling us something about him. He's not this holier-than-thou kind of guy, some kind of performer. He's broken over his sin. He, he knows that he has no business calling upon God's name. He has no standing, no ground that God should hear him. And so he's beating his chest, not as an act to get God's attention, but as an emphatic demonstration of his own brokenness over sin. And, and listen to him when he speaks, instead of bragging about the things he's accomplished, comparing himself to others, he doesn't do any of that. He cries out to God for mercy, identifying himself not as righteous, but as a sinner in need of grace. And so this man is not pretending to be something he's not. He, he knows who he is. He knows what he has done. He knows where to go. He's coming to the mercy seat of God. And so just in case <laughs> Jesus trying to drive the point home, don't, don't miss this. He gives us verse 14. He says, I tell you, this man, this tax collector, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who humbles himself, exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Again, church, it's not the guy with the resume that goes home accepted by God. In fact, that guy with the resume is the one who gets rejected. Rejected. God receives the humble, the broken, the repentant. That's the one who gets justified. That's the one who will one day be exalted. Friends, do you see anyone... Anyone can get in on this. No matter your background, no matter your sin, no matter your situation, God is not at all impressed by spiritual showiness. God, though, notices self-effacing surrender. And so I would just say, friend, if you've been listening to this message and you're here and you're hearing me talk about all this and you don't even know Jesus in a personal way, I just want to invite you to come to him come to him just like the tax collector in this story come humbly come seeking mercy come confessing sin come as you are but knowing that you will never be the same again because jesus has died on the cross for your sin and what that means is that you don't have to perform jesus paid the debt you owed god he died the death that you deserved he lived the life that you should have lived So friend, I'm saying the work has been done. Would you just repent and believe today and live? And church, the the same gospel that that opens wide the gates of salvation to the needy, to end of, at the end of their rope kinds of people, that same gospel fuels a culture of humility and authenticity that we long to see here. So I love what Spurgeon, how how he describes the church. He says the church is, is not an institution for perfect people, but it's a sanctuary for sinners saved by grace, who, though they are saved, are sinners still. They need all the help they can derive from the sympathy and the guidance of their fellow believers. The church is a nursery for God's weak children, where they are nourished and grow strong. It is the fold for Christ's sheep the home for Christ's family. Church, my prayer is that we would be that kind of people. A church that's made up of chief (laughs) repenters who see themselves as chiefs of sinners who then are chief repenters who seek to outdo one another in showing honor and confessing and turning from sin. And so, friends, this doesn't mean that you need to confess sin to every single person in this place and have the the same depth of relationship with every single person. But this means, though, that you should be doing these things with somebody. You should be real and vulnerable and honest and transparent and authentic with at least some here. Because the Christian life is not ultimately me and Jesus. It's we and Jesus. And we need each other in this fight and in this journey. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, 
by the new and living way that he has opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, church, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. And let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day of the Lord drawing near. Let's pray. Lord, we are a sinful, proud people. Lord, this church has a sinful, proud lead pastor. But God, I pray that you would make us like this humble, repentant, self-effacing tax collector. Lord, would you humble us by the great goodness and news of your gospel? (laughs) Who could stand proud at the foot of the cross, seeing what our sins have wrought and caused you? And so would you make this culture a reality in us? Would you do the work by your spirit that that I can't do, that we can't do, but you can do? Lord, have your way with us and make us this kind of church, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen.